Scotland's capital, Edinburgh, is a city rich in heritage, but few visitors appreciate that many of its fine Georgian streets stand on top of a network of subterranean layers. A lot of people get confused, really, how there's so much space down here. Within Southbridge, a labyrinth of cellars and passageways that lay forgotten for over a century, until an amazing discovery. So then I found a tunnel which led into the first of the vaults. But those vaults now reveal a sinister side to the city's past. They needed a constant supply of human corpses. She had the rise of body snatchers, grave robbers. Scotland is the UK's northernmost country, and its capital, Edinburgh, is home to nearly 500,000 citizens. The city stands among hills and valleys, and it is in this pastoral setting that former Scottish rugby star Nori Rowan accidentally became an expert on an underground world. I mean, Edinburgh's known as the city of seven hills. Because it's a city of seven hills, it's a, a city with lots of bridges connecting all these hills. In the 1980s, when Nori bought one of the old apartment buildings along the historic South Bridge, he discovered a blocked passageway. Started renovating the sub-basement, started digging everything out. So then I found a tunnel which led into the first of the vaults. Which made me realise there was more and more vaults. Nori didn't stop with this first discovery. He continued to delve deeper into the system, where he found rooms mostly filled with rubble. He dug them out, one bucket at a time not knowing why the waste was there or what lay beyond. This was virtually untouched from, I don't know, the 18th century, early 19th century. What were these trash-filled vaults he had stumbled upon? The answer can be found during the turn of the 19th century, when Edinburgh was about to be changed forever. In the 1700s, Edinburgh went through an immigration explosion. An influx of people flocked into the city, looking to avoid famines in rural areas of the country and get in on the Industrial Revolution. People began living wherever they could find space. To make the city more accessible, they built bridges to join the surrounding hills, and the first one was across the Cowgate Valley, where cattle were regularly driven into the city for market. Southbridge took three years to construct over the Cowgate Valley. At a thousand feet long, it was a marvel of its time. When it opened in 1788, a row of shops was built along the top. Simon Bendel guides visitors around the arches and subterranean spaces within the bridge. The bridge was built to span the Cowgate Valley, to link the old town in that direction to the, to the new suburb, supported by 19 large arches. Originally, those arches were open, so people could pass freely back and forth underneath the bridge. But quite quickly, buildings, tenement buildings, were built either side of the bridge, sandwiching the bridge, and then, and then closing the arches. In the 18th century, the now hidden arches were subdivided into vaults of various sizes for storage for the merchants above. There are at least 120 of these vaults, Jamie Corstofine is a Southbridge expert. They'd floor the big arches up to three times and then split them in half again. They ran corridors to connect them all. It would keep a source of income and they would keep that money to help for repairs and maintain the bridge. It was a great idea, it really was. For 30 years, the vaults worked according to plan and commerce grew along the South Bridge. But the bridge was constructed with cheap materials and soon the underground vaults turned into a nightmare for the city's residents. The bridge leaks from day one. The water sits on the top and it sits on the surface and it seeps 
through. And this wouldn't have been fresh rainwater we're talking about. This would have been water infused with horse droppings from the bridge above. And the contents of those uh, nasty buckets, as they called them, the slops buckets that the people used to throw out the window at night into the street. This raw sewage gradually seeped and dripped through the bridge, creating stalactites of effluent. The unsanitary environment turned the vaults into a rat-infested, disease-ridden slum. Because of this damp, disgusting conditions, really, businesses quickly abandoned these vaults. The vaults quickly became a living space for citizens who had fallen on hard times. Desperately poor people would have taken shelter down here. This was a time when people were pouring into Edinburgh from the Highlands uh, and from across the water in Ireland. So whole families, the poorest of the poor, would have lived down here in appalling conditions. And that continued right onto the 1860s. When the shopkeepers and artisans moved out of the deplorable vaults, Scotland's criminal underbelly saw an opportunity that was too good to pass up to establish their illicit black market away from the prying eyes of the law. The illegal trades decided, you know, why are we not using this space? It's vast, it's dark, it's perfect. And when the good guys moved out, that's when the bad guys moved in. And then the vaults were used by gangs of thieves, people running illegal whiskey stills, um, women pursuing the oldest profession. Anything that was illegal above ground was perfectly legal within the confines of the structure of the bridge. There was no police here. Among these poor families and petty thieves, there operated the most sinister criminals of them all. And that's when these vaults were handed over to the criminal types, the bootleggers and the body snatchers. In the 1830s, Edinburgh was renowned for its medical schools, and because of them, a grisly new trade sprang up. Enterprising criminals would dig up newly buried corpses from their graves and sell them to the medical students so they could study human anatomy. If you could deliver a body to a doctor in a good condition, you could get perhaps 10 pounds, which are years wages for a, for a laborer at the time. They needed a constant supply of human corpses to keep dissecting them for their students. Um, and and uh, the law at the time said only the bodies of executed criminals could be legally dissected. So you had the rise of body snatchers, grave robbers, or as they preferred to call themselves, the resurrectionists. To avoid the risk of arrest by the police, body snatchers worked in the dead of night. What grave robbers used to do is strip the bodies of any shrouds or clothes or any wedding rings because they feared that it could be charged with theft. Uh, and that was a capital crime, you'd hang for that. But if you were caught carrying a naked body around, it was more of a kind of weird new grey area. You'd more likely to be just charged with a lesser crime of desecrating a grave. In the early 19th century, the Southbridge vaults were apparently a hunting ground for the infamous criminals William Burke and William Hare. They came from Northern Ireland looking for work and created an entirely new business from the body snatchers. They embraced the crime of selling dead bodies for cash and took it one step further. Uh, the curious thing about Burke and Hare is they were neither Scottish nor were they body snatchers. They came from the north of Ireland in search of work. I suppose you could say they were innovators. They cut out the hard work of digging up their bodies and they just killed people instead. So they were serial killers. It is suspected the pair killed 16 people in 10 months, which resulted in Burke's execution and public dissection. The growing ill repute of the Southbridge vaults was a burden the upstanding citizens of Edinburgh would no longer tolerate. By the 1870s, the vaults were filled in with construction debris and lost to history. Despite Nori Rowan's extensive clearing of the vaults, there is still much to discover. I kept finding more chambers, and I just kept, it was quite exciting finding all these pieces. I kept thinking I was going to find the crown jewels or something really valuable. This is a tiny, tiny section of this entire structure when it first opened. It really was an underground labyrinth 
of tunnels and chambers. To this day, there is more to explore. Nori's taking Jamie into one of the deepest areas of the Southbridge vaults because he needs an expert opinion. So is this the original point of entry? It was through, it was through here, yeah. It's an area which Nori has dubbed the well. When I dropped the floor level here, lifted a slab here. As you can see, I found this big hole. There's a couple of tunnels going off to the left there and the right. This shaft drops for at least 30 feet and suggests a lower level that no one has ever explored before. So I suppose the next thing is to start having a wee look and see what's actually down there. Because these ledges, have you any idea where these could have been from? Because they're dead. No, I think that's just lintels spanning over just the tunnel. Spanning. You see, there's a tunnel goes off to the left there. Yep. No, it doesn't seem to be a well with all these tunnels well. off it. Eh? Well, exactly, because wells don't have archways in the walls, and wells are not paved at the bottom, which is that is clearly paving. While there are still areas of the labyrinth waiting to be examined, most of the vaults have been given new life since Nori rediscovered them 30 years ago. Music venues, comedy clubs, and even wine bars, paying homage to one of the original uses of the vaults. It got a nickname of Whiskey Row. Um, in 1815, one of the dis illegal, illicit distilleries was busted in here, this basement here. Despite its past troubles, Edinburgh's South Bridge is one of many great structures that has transformed the city. It is a brilliant piece of engineering. And its at full extent, I don't think we'll ever, ever find out or comprehend just how massive this place really was. The underground spaces created here gave the city's inhabitants both shelter and suffering. The reason why I find them so interesting, these vaults, is simple as they look, they're kind of like a window into the social history of Edinburgh. The stories of these spaces still capture people's imaginations to this day. Well, I think it's great that they're still being used here. They are 200 years after they were built and they're still in use for something. And they'll probably keep reinventing themselves as time goes on.